Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, attending the session. Um, so my name is Moshe Zadka. My website is cobotism.com, where you can find everywhere, every way contacting me, known to humankind. And I'm going to talk about screaming fast API clients. Uh, before I get into the details, uh, I just want to say, um, feel free to use the chat features. Feel free to use the q and I am not going to look at these things uh, until I am done with what I have to say, but then I will look at it and see if there's any issues and things, interesting questions that uh, I can address or any issues that people have with the talk that I can uh, speak to. So until then, feel free to chat among yourself, uh, of course, observing the code of conduct. I'm not in the right screen, sorry about that. Uh, I want to start with acknowledgement of country. Uh, I live in San Francisco Bay Area Peninsula, uh, which is the ancestral homeland of the Raimetush Ohlone people. And I want to start with why do we care about the speed of API clients? And I want to suggest that latency can kill your website. I, I can quote studies here. Uh, you can look them up yourself. It's very hard to find apples to apple studies. It's very hard to say what percentage of customers clearly matters what kind of website you're doing. But the general theme from all the studies converges around every extra 100 milliseconds of latency in your website rendering will lose a significant number of people coming in to use your website. So you want to minimize the latency. You want to make sure that your website is up and internally, your website is going to use an API because everybody uses microservice architecture. And I, I put the micro in parentheses because microservice architecture has a specific definition that is different than specific definition of service oriented architecture. And a lot of people will tell you this is not true microservice architecture, this is not true service oriented architecture. And there are differences and they matter for some purposes, but for my purposes, all these things that are service architecture like or microservice architecture like, sorry about that, um, are the same thing. And I'm gonna talk about what's common to all of them and why they make things challenging. The first thing is that they all are built in layers that traditionally start to kind of accrue really fast. Right, you start with maybe a simplistic front end talking to the back end, and then you end up having a middle thing that kind of has to talk to a few more things, and then that thing has to talk. And very quickly, you're going to end with like four or five layers, even for a, a medium kind of complexity website. Um, and the second thing that often happens in this kind of architecture is fan out. The reason you have all these nodes in the middle is because they don't ask just one question. They are going to have to ask several different things and um, and they're going to then compute somehow mush the data together and produce produce the output. So just a second, sorry about that. Um, so they, they have to produce the output and that's what they call fan out, right? How many things do you have to ask? And again, very quickly, this is gonna be bigger and bigger. And both of these things um, make the speed of the API client, the bottleneck in what is um, the common traditional, again, service architecture like thing, which most websites are built with. So, there's like one other thing that makes the speed of an API client behave kind of weirdly. And that's that the performance of um, things on the way, right? The performance of every step is not normal. It's log normal. And those things behave very, very differently. Um, and specifically, they behave differently in what is sometimes called black swans, right? How, how common are outliers? So a normal distribution behaves more or less, right, proportional to 
e to the minus x squared. If you're familiar with the square function, right, it rises pretty rapidly, right? Like already three squared is, is nine, 10 squared is 100, right? It, it goes pretty fast. And the exponential fa function grows, or in this case, because it's a minus sign, uh, um, goes down also pretty fast, right? We all are familiar with how fast exponential growth can, can go. Um, the combination of both the e and the x squared means that a normal distribution will be bunched up around the middle. It's, it's very fat in the middle and the outliers go down super fast. Log normal, it's, it's not really one over x um, because if you think about the mathematics involved, it, it can't really be, that would be uh, infinite expectations, but it's very, very close to that. And that, that, that's important. Outliers are much more common. And the reason this is so important is because we're used to thinking in terms of normal distributions intuitively, right? If you kind of think about how tall the person that, you know, you are going to meet if you, if you go out and, and, and look at the street, that's gonna be on a normal distribution, right? If you think about how fast people can run, right? And that's, you know, directly, right? If you think about how fast someone is gonna answer a question uh, in real life, that's probably gonna be on the order of normal distributions. But computers are usually better modeled by log normal, and that means outliers are much more likely. And why are outliers important? Because averages lie, right? You, if you start measuring things with um, averages and maybe even standard deviation, those things are really easy to measure, right? And, and, and they're like seductively easy to measure, right? They're good for normal distribution. They describe normal distributions pretty well. And they're really easy to calculate. If you think about how to calculate an average incrementally, um, you just have to add things to count them. And then when you ask about the average, divide them. If you also want to um, keep the standard deviation, you have to add the squares. And again, like do a little bit of a math thing when you're asked. They're very easy to calculate um, and pretty much because they're kind of like more or less linear, um, you can compute them in partial ways and that makes them really, really nice when they work with monitoring system that work with multi-stage um, multi compressions and all that things, they're great. And the problem is that they're also wrong for log normal distributions. They're very, very misleading. Um, and much like looking for your keys uh, under the lamppost, uh, that is not a good strategy for success in life or in writing fast API clients. Um, and so your backend is slow, right? And the reason I'm saying that is that even if on average it's fast, if you're, you know, you put in the effort and, and, and made it as fast as you can, it's still, again, on, on, as a distribution, it's gonna work on log normal, which means you're gonna see a lot of outliers and if you think about what kind of outliers you can get from an API, you can't get better than zero, right? As the speed of light is, you know, like the ultimate physical law, right? You cannot get faster than that. Um, when I say outliers, I mostly mean bad outliers, right? You know, you don't care if it's like fast, or really, really, really fast, right? That's, that's gonna be okay, that's, that's fine. Like, you know, it's, it's not gonna even gonna change the average a lot. The problem is that it can get really, really, really slow without affecting the average enough that you will see that. And those outliers can easily kill your API client and make it very, very slow. So when you think of your backend, even if your backend is fast in theory, when you look at the numbers, it's gonna have enough outliers that you have to treat it as slow. And this is kind of part of the challenge when writing your API client against the backend. The other parts that um, multiplicity magnifies your outliers. Um, with five queries, P90 becomes P50. A again, like the computation is kind of subtle, but P99 will become somewhere between P90 and P95. It means that very quickly your outliers, instead of being outliers, they'll be middle liars. As soon as you start fanning out, you're gonna see that you're gonna hit the unlikely case a lot, a lot more time. Again, this wouldn't happen if it was 
a normal distribution. Normal distributions make outliers so unlikely that it doesn't matter. The P99 becomes P90 will add maybe half a sun deviation. But that's not what happens in log normal. In log normal, when these things happen, they start making your API really, really slow if you're trying to query a number of things, even if they're all on the same backend and the backend is in general fast, but it has a bad P90 or P99. And a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about, a lot of the techniques um, that I'll introduce here um, are gonna deal with like all of these things. So I realized this is like, uh, I started to talk with uh, a lot of heavy math, but that's, uh, that's, that's really important to understand why we have these challenges. Um, and so when you measure your API speed, it's really, really important to measure histograms, not averages. Again, depending on your monitoring system, there's all kinds of configurations available. Uh, I, I do not want to get into that. My point is monitoring systems will try to get you to measure the average. That's the easiest thing to measure with the monitoring system, but that's a lie. Right? Even if you include the standard deviation, it's still a lie because the assumptions around um, how the average and standard deviation work together um, are only true for normal distributions and not for log normal distributions or, you know, there's a bunch of other ways to model performance, but they all have these like fat tail issues. So when you measure, make sure you measure histograms. Um, I'm going to talk about how to make the API um, client a bit faster. But ultimately, you'll want to measure if it's actually improving things, right? Some of these techniques um, can, can work can work badly in some situations. So make sure you start. The, the, the only way to start improving performance is to measure performance. The only way to measure performance accurately in this uh, um, kind of service architecture is to measure the histograms, not the averages, and see how much you're bumping into every histogram and then decide whether that's what you need or whether you still need to improve it. And the other aspect I'm going to talk about is that when you measure these things, you want to measure it in all the layers. You want to measure it with, you know, at the top layer is the front end. But when you're going to optimize, you're going to optimize parts in the middle and you want to make sure that you're measuring all these parts again by histograms. And that's sometimes not a lot of fun to configure with monitoring systems. That's like sometimes a, a political battle you have to you have to fight with the people in charge of like you know running these systems. And that's that's a really important point to insist. Until you do that, there's no use in making things faster. Because how will you actually know if you made things faster? Again, making the average faster, making the standard deviation faster is not enough. What you want to know is how did I affect the histogram, right? How did I affect the percentiles? So it's really, really important to push for that, to push the monitoring that, because only then will you know if the techniques I'm gonna show you on how to improve things are fast. And, and this is why I spent um, almost half of my talk on, on just talking about how to measure these things and why they're important, because the techniques themselves I'll introduce and I'll explain them. But you know, you're gonna have to play around with them anyway to figure out exactly how to apply them to your situation. The first step you want to make sure is that you'll know if you made things better or especially if you made things worse, because all of these things can easily make things worse if you misimplement them or implement them in the wrong situation. Um, but with that, first I want to introduce how a typical node in the middle looks like. And this is using Flask because this is um, one of the easiest ways I, I could put a slide that will make do something halfway interesting, um, but uh, still fit on one slide. So in this case, we have a backend and we get the same URL, right? Like, you know, in real life, obviously you'll pass different parameters, but maybe even like completely different backends, but this is a, an easy modeling, um, modeling function um, and it gets a value and then sum it up, which is kind of modeling the kind of computation you will uh, often do, right? Summation is kind of a nice function that takes a lot of arguments and returns one argument and then it returns um, a JSON, right? That's 
again, like all these things are very typical, you probably wrote some code that is possibly a bit more complicated, but if you've ever written um, something in the service architecture, you probably recognize the general structure. Um, so one thing to kind of think about here is that I am waiting for one thing to return before I call the next one, which means if something is slow, then I'm not gonna call the next one until that starts and that's gonna affect my performance. Um, so the first technique that I want to introduce is how to, how to make that in parallel. And you'll usually use some sort of async framework. Um, in this case, the async framework I'm gonna use is twisted and Klein because it's intended to look exactly like Flask so we can easily see the differences. Um, so as you can see, I separated out the sum in the calls to two separate stages. And the first stage I do await defer gather results and then I do the loop of um, get URLs. And what that does is it will return to me a, a list of futures and defer gather results will basically wait for all these futures or deferreds as Twisted calls them to be done. And then return to me a list of all the results. Um, and that means that I start all the calls in parallel. And that's a very powerful first technique. Um, and, and sometimes you do have dependencies, but often it is possible to first ask all your questions. And only once you're done asking, start um, doing the computation. And when you can reorder your code to be that, and you can see that even in my extremely small example, I had to reorder the code, right? I had to introduce the all values intermediate thing. It's not a big reordering, but I didn't have a lot of code. When you write code, you, you're gonna have to reorder it quite a bit potentially to take advantage of these async features, right? Just putting a weight where you didn't have a weight before is not gonna speed up your code at all. What you want is this, want to wait for the whole fan out and that's going to require some refactoring potentially if your code is more complicated than mine actually changing how functions interact but once you're done with that you get the parallelism and the parallelism does give you some benefit um so i, I kind of try to simulate that um in real life you don't want to simulate of course you want to actually measure but i don't have a huge website um with uh, thousands of customers per day i have a tiny lab so I, I simulated instead of actually uh, measuring. Um, but I did measure the P50, the P90, and the P99. And um, I used the backend that behaves um, like that. So that's kind of the behavior of the backend. And as you can see, the parallelism did give me a benefit, but it's a fan out of 10. You'd expect much more benefit. The reason it doesn't give you a huge benefit is again, because the one outlier, it's not that likely to have two outliers. It is possible. So this is why like the P99 is kind of bad. But if you have one outlier, that one outlier is gonna take most of the time. So it doesn't matter if you wait before that or after that or during, it's, it's not gonna be a big deal. It is, it did speed it up, right? Like the P90 is like half as big, right? So that's a huge speed up and that's a technique that is definitely useful. But um, it's kind of surprisingly not as helpful as you might think naively. Um, so the other thing that um, is often useful, again, after you start with the async stuff, because everything is gonna build on top of that, um, is to do timeouts and retries. And the reason is because there's all kinds of reasons why there's a temporary slowdown. There's a packet missing, right? If you just, you know, wait for that, eventually it will come back, but it kind of takes a bit of time. There's a snag that hit your, um, that, that backend, right? One, of your backends is slow, but you know, if you do kind of like a, some round robin routing, you're probably not gonna hit that one again. Um, so there's all kinds of things that can make the slowdown temporary. And again, that's kind of how you'd expect if you kind of just naively, again, model performance as uh, independent log normal. It, it doesn't help if there's persistent timeout, but then you actually just need to fix your backend. So timing out and retries is the next technique I wanna talk about. And here's how it looks. Um, all I did is uh, add a timeout uh, and then try again. And the second try, I'm gonna let it go as long as, as, as it wants. But just having these two tries 
it's it's a very simplistic retry mechanism, right? Like, uh, like in real life, you'd probably want to write something a little bit nicer, but this is this shows you what, like what's the minimum that you need to retry. Very simple, and then we'll call get with timeout instead of directly calling client get. Um, in the example, I didn't do that refactoring because that um, I, I don't think that's gonna uh, clarify things a lot more. But now that we have that, let's see how that can help us. So wow, that improved things a lot. The P50 is a lot faster. The P99 is like now half of the, the parallel um, version, right? The uh, P90 is much better. The P50 is much better, right? Suddenly like you're getting a, a, a website with this decent uh, performance. So together, uh, those two things, right? Timing out and retry pretty fast and um, and doing things in parallel start to really really have effect on our um, on our P50, P90, and P99. Um, and you might think that you know I wasted some compute resources, and I did, right? Like when you time out something that would have returned, right? Like I timed out after 0.1 second. If it would have returned after 0.1.1 after 0 0.11 seconds, then I'm just throwing this away and, and retrying again. And that's not great, right? And clearly we can do something better, but even, even this naive version, I only retry 25%, I, I forgot the percentage sign, I'm sorry here. Um, but I only, I only uh, retry 25%, which means I did increase my need of like backend resources by, you know, at peak 25%. Um, and, and if you think about it, this is a way of trading off, you know, OPEX or CAPEX or however it is that you pay for your computer resources for, um, for, for, for user facing performance. And whether that's worth it or not, I can't tell you, right? I don't know how, how much your computer resources uh, cost. I don't know how you pay for them. I don't know what kind of deal you get with your cloud provider or whatever. I don't know how much your users are worth, right? Like you want to measure this and you want to measure uh, user drop off depending by agency. But in general, this is a trade-off technique, right? And, and it's always when you do a trade-off technique, you want to measure how useful it is, right? Obviously you can uh, do like an A-B test or stuff like that. But in, in general, yes, this, this is, a technique that, that gives you um, an overhead on the backend usage of the usage of backend resources, but it does give you a significant um, speed up. So this is something to think about. Um, so th this is how you'd um, kind of uh, uh, do, and then also, oh, sorry, sorry. And the final technique I want to talk about um, is, is giving up. And, and giving up is super important, right? If you, instead of giving a slow answer, giving a failed answer is often much better. The thing in front of you probably has some way of dealing with your failures. You know, it, it, it might time out. It, it might just, you know, return a failure to each user and, and, and you're gonna, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, it, it might not care that much about your stuff. It, it's gonna wait, but eventually if you don't do it, it'll serve up a default. And sure, you don't want to fail too often. So I added a significant timeout the second time. I added a 0 0.04, a uh, 0 0.4 um, timeout. Um, but if you think about, if you look at like what I've done, I flattened the P99. Now I no longer have um, a really slow P99. Right now, now I have about 1% failure rate. So I converted the super high kind of unlimited uh, um, times to failures. And again, that depends on exactly how you think about your SLA. This is the, another trade-off. This, this is trading off uh, failures for really slow requests, but often you'll find that this makes things very easy, specifically if the thing in front of you does some sort of retry, you have made things a lot easier because if you think about it, the thing in front of you might often do you know, the kind of trick that I showed you, right? Timing out and, and, and retrying. If you're, if you're going over time, you should assume your client has already given up. You should give up yourself. 
that will save you a lot of compute resources and often won't lead to um, much worse user facing behavior. So this is, this is a final trade off that you want to do in API clients, just giving up. Um, there's a lot more variants to do that, right? You can uh, start a parallel version after 0.1 second and wait for the fastest to return. There's like a lot of tricks to, to do that. Um, that I don't want to get into two details. I, I, I hope I, I showed the main ways of thinking about this problem, how to approach it and how to make things faster. Um, and as always, um, this is about a lot about experimentation. So I want to leave you with these ideas. Um, latency is important. It's the difference between something that feels fun to use and something that nobody wants to use unless they're forced to. And you know, like whether you can force your user or not is, is not up to the API clients. But if you want something that people say, this is great to use, latency is one of the biggest parameters you can move, especially as backend developers. Um, the latency of a backend behaves like log normal. This is in general, again, like not everything is perfect, of course, in real life. Uh, um, distributions are more complicated, modeling is hard, but you should remember that if your first intuition is normal, then moving to an intuition about log normal things is gonna make a, a great um, great improvement in how you think about your backend, about your speed and about your constraints. Uh, the third thing is that like, it's really useful to have an SLA, right? To, to know what you're reaching for, to know what what you want to get out of things in the end because at least then you can know if you know it's achievable or not maybe you actually need to improve the backend first you you know where you are um so it's really important to measure these things like i said like you need to take the right measurements to know if you've made things faster or slower so that's that's really important again like use histograms actually look at the numbers you know do a b tests check check how you've changed things a lot of these things can make things slow right like i, I gave the example that i'm increasing the overhead of the backend if the backend is close to capacity increasing the overhead of the backend will make it a lot slower and and, and, and your timeouts are gonna again um explode out of proportion so a lot of these things can harm just as easily as they can uh, improve. Even just making async stuff um, increases the peak load on the on the backend because now you're doing all these 10 things at once. Um, it's not going to increase the average load, but if you have sharp peaks, that can increase them. So each of those techniques, and in general, that's true for almost any um, any optimization techniques that you can think of, um, can harm as easily as they can improve things you want to carefully measure. And finally, it is really useful to simulate. It's not an alternative to measurement, but it's really good to say, okay, I, I know how the backend behaves. Will these things have a chance of working, right? Simulation, just like in this case with, with my laptop, I didn't need to build up like a whole AWS cluster just to figure out what's gonna be true and what's gonna be not true. And even I was surprised by some of the behaviors simulating to figure out strategies that you later validate by measurement is a very, very powerful technique. Um, and I think with that, uh, this is all I had to say. So um, now is my chance to go into the Q&A and the chat and see if anyone had, okay, so if anyone does have questions, I don't see any questions right now in the chat, in the Q&A, uh, let me check the chat, chat. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. So um, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll give it one more minute to see if anyone has uh, questions. Uh, please feel free to use the uh, Q&A tab and, and put any questions you have. And if not, then I guess we can, uh, we can finish early. Uh, and, and once again, thank you all. Uh, for uh, attending the talk and for listening uh, to me um, go on and on about uh, how to make your API clients faster. Uh, I, I hope that this will make your websites 
uh, better. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to wait another couple of minutes. Uh, and, and then probably if, if nobody has any questions, um, I will I will head out. Um, so yeah, I see many people are starting to leave. Well, I, I'm glad I answered all your questions. Um, or maybe I uh, um, talked about math so much that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, your questions are too complicated to, to ask. Um, I will make the uh, slides and the notes uh, available uh, in some place. I'll, I'll talk to the uh, all things open people and figure out how to link that for my session. Um, I'll wait another minute to see. Um, everyone who said thank you, uh, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure. This is something I um, obsess about in my day-to-day -day life um, because this is the kind of questions I'm often asked. Um, I'm, I'm actually not like a, um, a full-time backend developer. I'm, I'm a, mostly a systems or a site reliability engineer. Uh, but this is a question backend developers ask me, like, why is this slow? And how can I make it faster? So uh, these are the things I, I obsess about. So I'm super happy to be um, talking to you all about these things. Um, I will wait maybe another 30 seconds to see if anyone. Uh, yes, I'm happy to show the first slide. Uh, I'm not sure which slide you mean. Um, this is the intro slide. Um, I, I don't know, but uh, um, this is maybe the first slide that is kind of actually part of the talk. Uh, I talked a little bit about how latency is a problem for um, for sites and hopefully to motivate, even even though you're all here and, and I guess you chose that, uh, um, I, I still wanted to motivate why, why I'm talking uh, for 30 minutes about how to make your uh, API clients faster. And I think, I, I don't see any questions. Um, if you still have stuff, uh, feel free um, to reach out to me on the Connect platform and I'll, I'll try to look at stuff. Uh, but for now, again, thank you all and uh, goodbye. And I hope you have uh, uh, fun in the rest of the, um, rest of the session in the conference, which I'm sure will be excellent.